Canada's broadcast regulator, the CRTC, has been conducting ongoing hearings called Let's Talk TV. One change emerging from these hearings is a major change to something that many would say helped shape Canadian culture, CanCon rules, rules that stipulated the amount of Canadian content broadcasters have had to offer. Joining us now as we explore whether CanCon has outstripped its usefulness, we welcome Kelly Lynn Ashton, media consultant and former director of policy for the Writers Guild, and John Doyle, television critic with the Globe and Mail, and it's good to have both of you here in our studio, I think for the first time. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Good, good to welcome both of you. Let's, uh, Sheldon, if we can, put these graphics up here just to show everybody how things have changed. Here's what the old rules about CanCon had to say. During the weekdays, in prime time, the schedule had to include 50% so-called CanCon, Canadian content. In the daytime, it had to be 55%, and specialty channels had anywhere from 15 to 85%. Now, here's what the new rules are on offer. Weekday prime time, still 50%, that hasn't changed, but daytime, zero, and specialty channels, 35%. So big change in particular during the day. Kelly Lynn, let me start with you. How significant do you think this ruling is? Well, it's not going to have a major impact on what most people are watching, the primetime dramas. The idea is to take whatever money was being spent on daytime and put that into the primetime dramas so that they can be bigger and more competitive with American dramas. That's the theory. Do That's you the think theory. that makes sense? Well, I think what it does is it takes away diversity in the system. There was still programming that was being um, produced for daytime. There was exhibition hours that were being used for repeats. Um, so the, um, having corner gas in the afternoon on a Saturday afternoon, they won't do that. They also will no longer be putting the littlest hobo on Saturday morning still, and that might be a good thing. <laughs> that might so. be a good thing. Join your view on these changes. Well, as, as usual, when the CRTC makes an announcement or changes its policy, it's bewildering to most people, even to me. I mean, Kelly Lynn is the policy analyst. I'm the television critic. Uh, a lot of the, the policy, the changes are so arcane, I, I don't even understand it. But what intrigued me about this, uh, this new statement from the CRTC was that it was preceded by a speech by the head of the CRTC in which he really talked about three main points. One is he talked about quality over quantity, that being a name for Canadian television. Second, he talked about the, the possibility of Canadian television using Canadian writing. That is, he, he had a long list of prominent Canadian writers and their works that might be the basis for Canadian television. And third, he talked about the issue of what he called discoverability. And that's, one of the, that, that's a CRTC term for finding out what Canadian shows are on TV and figuring out how Canadians find out about them. So it's three pillars by which to create a new system. Do you have any objection to these three? I don't have, well, I have some objections, yes. Um, in general, I think that, you know, the, the quality over quantity issue, it's great that the head of the CRTC is finally talking about that because it is something that I, as a critic, a citizen, and a consumer of Canadian television, have been bothered by for some time. That is, it, it's, a, it's a key question, a rhetorical question. Where is Canadian television in this golden age of television? It's been more than 15 years since this age of great TV storytelling started with uh, HBO's The Sopranos mm -hmm. and has gone through those years with Mad Men, Breaking Bad, countless other shows. Game of Thrones, we, House we, of Cards. We have on contributed on. almost nothing to this. Hmm. So to, to hear somebody from uh, the head of the CRTC talk about the quality issue, I think is great. However, you can't mandate quality into existence. You can encourage it. The second thing I, I, th I find kind of dubious is insisting that Canadian writing become the basis for Canadian television. They are two entirely different forms. I, the great television of the last 15 years of this golden age is not most of it based on writing, based on novels or short stories. A television, great television, comes into being organically out of from the minds of people who understand how television works. So uh, you know, I think that's that's kind of bogus as uh, as putting it in there as part of how to make Canadian television better. Let me put the first thing that you said to Kelly Lynn, which is namely this notion that the the, the golden age of television, as we are experiencing it over the last decade and a half, has somehow bypassed Canada. Do you think that's true? No. 
Uh, and I think if you look at the audience numbers for the Canadian drama that we've got, the audience is saying that they're they're happy with what we're getting because they're watching it. Like they're, what? Uh, well, the season ender of Saving Hope, which just was a couple of weeks ago, had 1.7 million. There was a point where we couldn't get past a million, and now we're getting 1.7, which is competitive with Grey's Anatomy and The Arrow and all these big American dramas. The, the uh, Golden Age shows that, that John's talking about, those are cable shows. Those are smaller audience shows. It is harder for us to get that kind of quality because we don't have the machine behind it. We don't have the volume that allows the golden shows to, to rise to the top, which is where my problem with quality over quantity um, comes in, because you have to have enough quantity to get that quality. Well, it's always a bit cheeky to quote another newspaper writer to another newspaper writer, but let me try this anyway. Here's William Watson writing in the Financial Post on this issue, and then I'll get you two to comment on it. He says, we used to have a television strategy that emphasized, quote, telling each other our own stories. Once Canadians actually got broadcast choice, of course, they tended to watch other countries' stories, mostly America's. So this strategy evolved to producing stories about ourselves that broadcasters are required to air in hopes that will create an infrastructure that at some stage somebody might use to make a story about ourselves that other Canadians might actually volunteer to watch. Canadian producers have grown used to producing shows that get aired whether people watch or not, he says. Sure, it's nice if they draw an audience, but there's no need. Their main purpose is to fill what little airtime the CRTC won't open to the U.S. programming that pulls in real audiences and makes real money. Is he right about this? There are some uh, fair <laughs> points there, but it, it's also, I think, opening a can of worms. Uh, and, and I begin by responding to what Kelly Lynn said. Uh, there is a huge difference between populist television and great television. Uh, Kelly Lynn cited Saving Hope, and it, it had you know 1.3 million viewers, whatever. That's nice, but it is a it is based on a template of American commercial broadcasting. It is it has nothing to do with the golden age of television, and I think one of the great criticisms of the industry here can be said to be a paucity of ambition in terms of excellence, in terms of making provocative, daring television that is being made in countries throughout the world. It is not just niche cable, as some people would say. It is made by public broadcasters, in particular, all over the world. Uh, we become risk averse, and I think we are way behind culturally in terms of the television we I make. I think Strange Empire was a risky show. It didn't get a great audience. I think, you know, we can name Orphan Black. That's a pretty risky show that's been very critically well received. Um, it's a sort of, it started cable, they replayed it on CTV, it's gotten awards in the States. You and know, awards here? And awards here. Um, you know, Slings and Arrows, which was very well critically received. Didn't hang around very long. Oh, it had three seasons. Is that a long time? For Canadian television, For Canadian television that's a long time. Okay, okay. Uh, but, you know, we, I don't know any producer, any writer who is not trying to do their best. Sometimes the broadcasters, I admit, and they'll admit, are trying to just fill slots. But a lot of the funding so is dependent on Canada Media Fund, which is based on audience success. So you're, they're trying to get the bigger audience. So there's a built-in incentive to program to the sort of lowest common denominator, can I no, put it that way? Uh, I wouldn't say lowest you common. You don't like that expression? No, I think no. it's fair. But I for a large audience, and this is what the government mandated. They said, we want popular programming that Canadians are going to watch. Let's, let's pick up on the CanCon issue, because John, I don't think there's any disagreement that CanCon really helped create a Canadian music industry. There, there, yes, there are a tremendous did. number of Canadian yes. uh, popular recording artists today, in part because there were rules saying you got to play whatever it was, 50% airtime on the radio for Canadian artists. Um, television, do you think CanCon's had the same kind of success? It hasn't, uh, but CanCon does need to exist. I mean, I would not be an advocate for, uh, for doing away with, with Canadian content regulations. We live in a, in a, in a peculiar cultural circumstance next door to the, the behemoth of, of the U.S. entertainment industry. Canadian content regulations are necessary because if they didn't exist, Commercial broadcasters in Canada would fill the airtime with American programming, mm -hmm. and, and that would be truly the lowest common denominator. Canadian content has to exist, but I think in terms of the quality of the television we make here, we have become, 
the industry has become comfortable with regulation, with what has to be done by regulation, and it has stopped being ambitious about making truly great television. Kelly Lynn cited uh, Strange Empire, CBC. A, a, yes, a, a one of those shows that would enter into that arena of this, this golden age. But CBC canceled it after one season. I think one of the key issues in this debate is what is the role of the CBC? And I would say it is up to a public broadcaster to make those challenging, provocative shows. Do they have enough money to do that? Well, they have money to do all kinds of things. They have money to make uh, uh, popular shows. And they're, with the cancellation of Strange Empire, I think, it seemed to me that was a step backwards. That is, CBC is, is going back to saying, we're not going to air shows that don't have a big audience, even if it's really great television, even if, it, even if it's challenging television, even if it's television for a small, discerning audience. They've abandoned that. I think that's wrong of a public broadcaster mm -hmm. to do. We obsess a lot in this country in a way that they don't in other countries around the world, I think, on this notion of what it means to reflect our stories on our screens and what does it mean to be a Canadian and what's a Canadian story anyway. Uh, does any, is the CRTC as fixated on this as uh, maybe the John Doyles of the world or others seem to be? No, they have to look at it from a much more industrial perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's objective, what is Canadian, it's based on their, their rules as well as the government's CAVCO rules, which is not how much money is spent on uh, Canadians the talent, the creative uh, enterprises. Who directs it, who's who, writing it, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a, a point scale. system. Yeah, there's yeah. a point system. But they're, they're now easing up on that point system, right? They've created two exceptions mm -hmm. um, to the point system uh, for budgets over $2 million or the literary ad adaptations um, that John was referring to. And in that case, the writer has to be Canadian, one of the actors, and then the 75% has to be spent on Canadians, but not necessarily in Canada. And the director doesn't have to be Canadian anymore. That well, it, the rules were always one of writer or director. Huh, okay. But this exception, it seems, from my reading, to allow um, non-Canadians to own the shows and produce the shows. Hmm. And it seems to be a way to bring in Hollywood money, who are going to spend their money on talent in Hollywood who happen to have Canadian passports. These shows, unless the rules change with all the funding organizations, they won't qualify for funding at the Canada Media Fund for tax credits. So I'm not sure how they're going to be funded unless these Hollywood studios pay the full budget. Hmm. So in a realistic way, I'm not sure how often these exceptions are going to be used. Let's talk about whether these changes are going to bring further changes to the way people watch television because uh, you know, one of the things they've also said is that we know people are, what are they called, cable cutters? Is that what they're, uh, what's Cordies. the expression? Cord, Cord cutters. cutters. Cord cutters, right. Uh, there are people who uh, don't pay for cable anymore. There are people who will never, never will again. Uh, how prepared do you think Canadian production companies are prepared to compete in an industry where people can watch anything from anywhere, anytime, all the time now? I think the Canadian industry is behind. I think uh, out of a, I, I think a, a position of, of smugness with the business model that commercial Canadian television had for so long, that is it was able to buy American network shows, simulcast them, then conform to the regulation with a certain amount of Canadian content. It, it failed to keep pace with the industry as it was changing throughout the world. It, I think the internet came as a surprise to many in Canadian television, and they were slow. I think Canadian commercial broadcasters were slow to catch up with the internet, with the, the, different, what, the different platforms on which people can watch television. They're still playing catch up, and I think you can see that in the reaction, the horrified reaction to the popularity of Netflix from Canadian commercial broadcasters. Mm -hmm. I spoke to somebody who will remain nameless because of, I don't want to out her, but um, she works here, and she says, I just canceled my cable. And I said, well, how do you get your news? What do you watch for local news? She said, I don't anymore. Well, how can you not watch local news? Are you kidding? By the time it's on the local news, I've seen it on Twitter eight hours ago. I mean, we're going into a brave new world here. I'm not sure anybody knows where it's going to end up. But how, you know, how well positioned or not is this domestic industry to deal with all of the new tastes that are clearly 
emerging. Well, I'll agree that the broadcasters are behind. They have been comfortable with their model and they wanted to keep that model. But the producers are the ones who have to be uh, more nimble. They've been online, they've been seeing what's been happening, and they are making um, efforts to create lower um, budget content or for the web only. They're developing you know, divisions of their companies that do web only content. They see the, the writing on the wall that they've got to diversify and find different ways of getting their content to the audience. Well, one of the ways I gather is offering this, what are they calling it, skinny basic? Yeah. Skinny basic packages. So instead of this $125 a month, you want this channel, you've got to take these five as well. It's a lot more, right, a lot more direct. I want that channel, I want that channel, I don't want this, and I'll pay 25 bucks a month instead. Well, Any concerns about that? 25 is just for that skinny basic. Right. If you also want to have TSN or CBC News Network or Food TV, then you will either have to pick those channels and who knows how much that's going to cost sure. you. Sure, but I, I, I gather the fear here is that a lot of people won't pick those other channels. They may rip them off over the air on a free HD antenna or they may just go without. They'll take their 25 bucks a month, they'll watch whatever else they want on, on their computer screens and then the revenues that uh, Roger Shaw Bell need to do all these other shows that we're talking about won't be there. Is that a scenario you're concerned about? It's a scenario that is possible and we just don't know how consumers are going to behave. There, during this hearing there were a lot of studies about well this is what this consumer is going to do and they were all conflicting because we really don't know how many people are going to say okay I'm cutting or I'm shaving my, my cord to go down to the, the $25 package, mm -hmm. or I'm going to pick just those particular show channels that I want and others are going to die, or whether they're just going to say, this is too complicated and I'm going to stay with my big package because it gives me choice. It allows me to browse through the different services depending on how I'm feeling. Do you see a lot of channel, uh, I won't say a lot, do you see channels dying as a result of this new approach? I think it's possible. I think it's, it's the worst case scenario. Uh, I think that there will be some channels that will be orphaned, that will, will not have enough subscribers uh, to exist. Uh, but I think it, it's, it's a case where the market will, will decide. If there isn't a genuine interest for that niche channel, then it really doesn't deserve to survive. Uh, you know, one thing though, I, I challenge the idea that, the cliche that Everybody is going to become a cord cutter, and everybody is going to be watching television off their laptop or smartphone, and that their connection to the old television model will be complete will completely disappear. I, th I think there's there's a there's a separate trend which is not enough attention is being paid to. That is, you have young people, people in their, who are teenagers into their twenties, who at this point don't have a television, don't have cable. They watch on their laptop. Sometimes they pirate download shows and so on. But when they get their first job, when they get their first apartment, when they get their first condo, part of what they want is a is a big screen television, right. and they want a lot of channels. And that's when I think the old model comes back in. Mm -hmm. It's not possible to say everybody's a cord cutter now and everybody's watching TV online. I am very curious about how the Globe and Mail's television writer consumes television. How do you, do you have cable? Yes, I do. I have cable at home, yes, and, uh, and in my office. How many channels do you think you actually watch? Uh, I watch a fair bit. I, 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 a, uh, I watch a lot of different channels because I also write about soccer. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. I need yeah. to have a, lo a, lo a lot of channels. But I mean, for, for me, just as, as a consumer, it does come down to a core group of channels. Um, let's say FX, when Amer the American cable channel, there's an FX Canada too, mm -hmm. which probably has the strongest slate of, of dramas right now. That's a channel I would watch regularly all the time. Because I think I get 500 channels, but I, I doubt I watch more than six of them. I mean, is that typical? I, it's. You probably watch fewer than a lot of people, but then you mm. work in this industry, so you're yeah. surrounded by it all day. You're not the typical typical consumer who goes home and wants to be entertained by a variety mm. of sources. True. Do you? How do you watch television? Oh, I watch a lot of television. But do you, are you on cable? I'm, I have cable. Um, I have a lot of channels. Do you watch anything on your computer screen? Yeah. You do. Yeah, uh, on my iPad. Um, it all depends. You know, sometimes I'll watch. You know, Netflix 
on my iPad in bed before going to bed. I also have a teenager, so there's fighting over the big screen TV. <laughs> so yeah. the fact that you know one of us can go away to the laptop or the iPad, that's very handy. I can't wait to see how all this is going to roll itself out, but we thank both of you for coming in tonight and helping us figure it out anyway. Thanks once again to Kelly Lynn Ashton and John Doyle for coming into TVO tonight. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.